You know, when I was a little boy, my brother and I were always sitting in church because my dad was the preacher, and we were in church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. We had a lot of church in our life. And so I remember that, you know, from time to time, we would sit beside each other, and uh, to pass the time, we would annoy each other. Now, you can do that in a quiet, invisible way, but then sometimes, if you're brothers, it escalates bit by bit. And I remember one time, we had strategically sat in the back of the church so my mother couldn't see us, but we forgot that our dad was standing in the pulpit and could see us. I'll never forget when as we sat there, kind of like pushing each other and bugging each other, that it got a little quiet and my dad said into the mic, Eddie and Greg, stand up and walk up here to the front and sit beside your mother. Now, if you're not a preacher's kid, you probably don't have that as a memory. You're so lucky. The whole church watched us as we made our walk of shame down to the front and sat by mom. We also knew that that would not be the end of the disciplinary effort. The handwriting was on the wall. And sure enough, when we got home, my dad had more to say and a little more to do. Have you ever heard that phrase, the handwriting is on the wall? You know, I think a lot of people say that and they have no idea where that came from. It actually comes out of the book of Daniel Daniel chapter 5, and that's the story we're going to look at today. The handwriting was on the wall. So I want to start, first of all, by noticing, like in chapter 4, as uh, Andrew Albritton explained to us, the King Nebuchadnezzar, he truly was an amazing king, a great builder and leader, one of the most powerful men in all of the ancient world. He had built a great city, and one day he was standing around looking at all the wonderful structures and the hanging gardens, and he, and he said to himself, look at all that I have done. And, and, and the scripture says his heart was filled with pride. He had previously been warned by the prophet that pride would be a stumbling block he should avoid, but he didn't do it that day, and God had had enough. He was struck with a mental illness that he became, like, he became like an animal. He was on all fours, ate grass for seven years. He was crazy king. At the end of seven years, God decided to restore him to the kingdom, which is incredible. You would have thought that there would have been plenty of time and opportunity for strong people in the kingdom to have staged a successful coup d'etat, but somehow... Under God's lead, I think, he survived. And in verse 37 of chapter 4, Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven, all of whose works are truth, and his ways are justice, and those who walk in pride he is able to put down. There seemed to have been sort of a change of heart. Don't know exactly how extensive that change of heart was for Nebuchadnezzar. But we do know that there was kind of an expansion of the study and the worship of the God of heaven because when Jesus was born, there were some wise men from the east. Have you ever heard the term wise men before in this series? That's what Daniel was. I mean, this is generations later, but the imprint of the study and exposure to the God of heaven, most likely through Daniel, who was the leader of the wise men, they were studying and they were able to discern that a, when the star appeared in the sky that God was up to something and they followed the star to find this king of kings and lord of lords. Now in Daniel chapter 4 it ends and we see that uh, Daniel is probably, scholars say, he's around 49 years old. You get to chapter 5, and the name of the king has changed, and many years have has passed. In fact, Nebuchadnezzar has died. There's been some tumultuous 
uh, you know, uh, passage of the kingdom, and it finally lands to this man named Nebuchadnezzar. Um, actually, scholars said that Daniel couldn't be an inspired book by God because the historical fact is not that Nebuchadnezzar was the king. The king was Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar was the father of Nebuchadnezzar. He was like a second or a third king in the transition between uh, uh, Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar. Um, and what happened was Nebuchadnezzar, I don't think he much enjoyed being the king in Babylon. He much preferred to be somewhere else. And so he appointed his son, Neb uh, Belshazzar, as the co-regent. And he took a vacation somewhere in the Middle East, somewhere. It wasn't until recent historical uh, findings proved that, in fact, the Bible was accurate, that though Nebuchadnezzar was the king, Belshazzar was the co-regent and was the one reigning actually in Babylon, as Daniel reported. That's just sort of biblical nerd stuff, but it's significant. So in verse 1 of Daniel chapter 5, this young king, Daniel himself now is probably around 80 years old. Shout out to all the 80-year-olds in the crowd. N none of you responded. I know somebody out here has got to be 80 plus. Oh, I'm, I'm getting some fingers pointing. God bless you back there. Belshazzar the king made a great feast for a thousand of his lords and drank wine in the presence of the thousand. While he tasted the wine, Belshazzar gave the command to bring the gold and silver vessels from his, from his father Nebuchadnezzar that he had taken from the temple which had been in Jerusalem, that the king and his lords, his wives, his concubines might drink from them. Now, first of all, notice he's breaking from tradition. Not only are the lords there, but he's bringing all of his wives in and his concubines. Not usually a really good combination, I'm just going to say. He was clearly trying to set up sort of a liberal, uh, loose party atmosphere, the wine and the women. Okay, that's what he was doing. They brought the gold vessels that had been taken from the temple of the house of God, which had been in Jerusalem, and the king and his lords, his wives, his concubines, drank from them. They drank wine and praised the gods of gold and silver, bronze and iron, wood and stone. He takes these vessels and intentionally defies the God of heaven by lifting them up in praise to idols. The same hour, the fingers of a man's hand appeared and wrote opposite the lampstand on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. And the king saw the part of the hand that wrote. Then the king's countenance changed, and his thoughts troubled him, so that the joints of his hips were loosened and his knees knocked against one another. Now all of the king's wise men came, and they could not read the writing or make known to the king its interpretation. Then King Belshazzar was greatly troubled. His countenance was changed, and his lords were astonished. You talk about a party crasher. Belshazzar calls his, his wise men, promises to give them wealth and honor and a gold chain and to make them the third in the kingdom. Why the third? Because uh, Belshazzar was number two. His father, Nebuchadnezzar, was number one. That was the next highest position available to be given. So it seems like odd. Why am I going to make you the third? You're happy with number three? You know, the, you, you win the bronze today. No, that's not what he was doing. He was saying this is the next available position. And then the queen mother sends word to the king and says, Belshazzar, there is a man in the kingdom, a wise man among, from the Hebrews, who has in the time past interpreted dreams and visions for the kings who were your predecessors. You need to go find him. Verse 13, then Daniel was brought in before the king. The king spoke and said to Daniel, are you that Daniel who is one of the captives from Judah, whom my father the king brought from Judah? I have heard of you, that the spirit of God is in you, 
and that light and understanding and excellent wisdom are found in you. Now, the wise men, the astrologers, have been brought in before me that they should read this writing and make known to me its interpretation, but they could not give the interpretation of the thing, and I have heard of you that you can give interpretation and explain enigmas. Now, if you can read the writing and make known to me its interpretation, you shall be clothed with purple and have a gold chain around your neck, and you shall be third ruler in the kingdom. Then Daniel answered and said before the king, let your gifts be for yourself and give your rewards to another. Yet I will read the writing to the king and make known to him the interpretation. It's so interesting, Daniel's response. And this is consistent as he stands before the kings. Daniel's response has been to refuse the gifts and to refuse to stand in front of the king and say, well, you're lucky to have a smart guy like me. Right? He's like, no, no, actually, king, I don't know the interpretations, but I will seek God and he will tell me and then I will deliver the word of God to you is what I'm going to do. I'm not looking for a promotion or money. I've got enough gold chains in my life. Daniel walks with humility. Daniel never forgets who he is. He's the servant of God. He's not seeking his own glory. Um, O king, verse 18, the most high God gave Nebuchadnezzar your father a kingdom and majesty, glory, and honor. Notice what he's pointing out. Great King Nebuchadnezzar was where he was and who he was because the God who rules heaven gave him this position and the majesty and the kingdom. And because of the majesty that he gave him, all peoples, nations, and languages trembled and feared before him. Whomever he wished, he executed. Whomever he wished, he kept alive. Whomever he wished, he set up. And whomever he wished, he put down. But when his heart was lifted up and his spirit was hardened in pride, take a note, what does pride do to your heart and my heart and everybody else's heart? It hardens our hearts. He was deposed from his kingly throne. They took him, they took his glory from him. When then he was driven from the sons of men. His heart was made like the beasts, and his dwelling was with the wild donkeys. They fed him with grass like oxen, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven. Yet he knew that the Most High God rules in, in the kingdom of men and appoints over it whomever he chooses. Here's the point, uh, Belshazzar. You have just thrown a party in an effort to glorify yourself and to proclaim to everybody inside and outside of the walls of Babylon that you are all it, that you have all the power, that you are so strong and able, you are not even afraid to defy the God of the Hebrews, the God of heaven, whom your ancestor Nebuchadnezzar said he is the God who rules eternally the nations of the world and gives according to his his will, rulership to everyone who reigns. It's not going to work for you. So the, I have two points. The first one is uh, the prideful king throws a wild party. That's what he does. Now, have you ever heard this? There's always a story behind the story. You know, we hear headline news. And then weeks, months, even years later, we hear the story behind the story. You get what I'm saying? That's why we make bad judges for one another because we get the headlines from each other and then sometimes we act like the judge of each other and we get it wrong because we don't know the circumstances, the story behind the story. You get what I'm saying? Have you ever felt misunderstood because someone just presumed they knew everything that was going on and judged your response and judged your situation based upon what they knew and there was so much more that you'd have endured and experienced and so you get condemned and judged and rejected and that's, that's a painful experience. There's always a story behind the story. Just remember that every headline you hear, there's a story behind the story. Here's the story behind this king who is highly motivated to throw the party of all parties with wine, women, and religious uh, vessels from the temple of the living God. Why is he so over the top? Well, here's what's going on. History tells us that a huge shadow had just fallen over the Babylonian empire and the kingdom of Belshazzar. A week before this party was thrown, 
A man by the name of Cyrus the Persian had surrounded Babylon. He had just defeated the Babylonian army decisively. And what this meant was that although Babylon was a a walled city, they were actually defenseless. The army had already been defeated. Everybody inside the walls of Babylon, they were beginning to freak out. A sense of dread and fear was coming over them. What's going to happen? I mean, this... This kingdom has never experienced this kind of an existential threat like we see today. I mean, will this king who conquered the army, will he come marching into the city of Babylon and kill the king, the royal family, and the lords, which is all of us in this room? Or is there a chance that he would send a diplomatic delegation and we could broker a deal of some kind and survive? Nebuchadnezzar responds, to this time, and he says, don't you worry. I got this. I have lived like a king. I am still a king. In all my might, power, and majesty, I'm throwing this party to make everybody remember how great I am and and forget how close to destruction we are. Now, Nebuchadnezzar, the former king, had left a magnificent structure in the city of Babylon. It was a city that was fortified with three rings of walls, 40 feet high. These walls were so wide that the historian Herodias said that the walls were so thick you could even have chariot races on the top of these walls. This this system of walls and defenses, they occupied, they, they surrounded an area of 200 square miles, which is about the size of Chicago today. And they had so much land that they could actually grow food. What about water supply? The river, the Euphrates River flowed under the walls and into the city so they had all of the irrigation they need. They would not go thirsty and they could continue to grow their crops. They could take care of their animals. They, unlike other cities, could not be be defeated by a siege. A siege is when an, uh, an enemy army surrounds the city and just holds up right there and waits for the food supply and the water supply to be depleted and then everybody starved to death. But that wasn't going to happen to Babylon and this gave Belshazzar a lot of moxie and a lot of confidence. But I think at the heart of all of this show was a fear and a dread. What's going to happen? You know, um, our world has been trying to figure out what to do with fear and dread for a long time. I don't know if you've noticed, but everybody dies. Have you noticed that? I hate death. We're going to have a memorial service for my dad in Manila on Tuesday. And honestly, I'm so tired of this. What do you do with this idea that you're going to die? There was a man by the name of Ernest Becker who won a Pulitzer Prize in 1974. He actually died in 1973, but they, they awarded it posthumously to him. He had written a book about this, this whole idea of, of death, and, and um, he was an agnostic, and um, he was trying to make sense of dealing with this idea of dying and it was such a painful discussion and it came up with this idea that actually um, human beings are not able to deal with our mortality. That um, we're always looking for a solution. I mean, he personally believed and he, he, he carefully evaluated his own dilemma and he honestly admitted that he, it was terrible and frightening and it was an untenable truth that if when we die, that's just the end of us and what we've done here doesn't ever matter and eventually the sun's gonna burn out and everything that you and I know and that exists today is gonna just evaporate and then that means that, that nobody, nothing will remember anything you've done and if, if everything is meaningless and nothing matters, then there is no sense of truth, there is no morality, nothing matters. If you hug someone or slap someone, it has the same moral value. I mean, nothing is going to matter because we're all going to die. All of these ideas 
were carefully and honestly put forward in his writing. It's almost like that, you know, this just is an incredibly painful thing, like a gnashing of the teeth, a scratching on a chalkboard, the angst at the center of our soul. Why do we find this idea of we're dying and it doesn't matter and nothing matters so unacceptable? I mean, could it be that there's another story we were made for? That's what the Bible says. Could it be that there is a God in heaven who personally made every single one of us? And this God in heaven actually defines morality, right and wrong and truth. And God, he created us to love us. It brings God great glory when you and I thrive like a father who buys his son an expensive toy and watches his son play with it and delights as his son plays. That's what God does for us. Why do we matter? Because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him, I quote this verse every week because I love it so much, should not perish. Wait a second, there's no dread or fear or meaningless here. God sent his son because he loved the world so very much so that we would not perish but have everlasting life. He didn't send them to condemn us for our sin and we've got plenty of that. He came to save us from our sin. That even though we were sinners, Christ died for us while we were still sinners. When we were still the enemy of God, the love of God was so overwhelming and so great that he died for his enemies, that we are saved by grace. It is the gift of God, not of our own works, lest anyone should boast. And God, who created us and saved us, has designed us for good works, so our lives matter. There's meaning to what we accomplish. You and I can live our lives today, and it will affect the people around us and the generations that will follow. And so we don't live meaningless, purposeless, empty lives we can live in a satisfying relationship with the God who made us for a plan and a purpose, who loves to bless us and help us. And it doesn't mean that there's not trouble, but even trouble, if you're connected to this God, the trouble has meaning because according to scripture, troubles and trials serve to make us stronger. It is the antithesis to throwing a big party in a moment of despair. It was this understanding that kept Daniel thriving in the chaos of up to this point about 65 years of Babylonian kings, kingdoms, and transitions. He had experienced so much hurt, struggle, and difficulty, but he had also experienced the, experienced the mighty hand of God who always remained as king of all and ruler of all. And in that truth, Daniel thrived in the chaos. That's the difference. You know, when you, when you think about the story that God presents to us, it just like resonates with our soul, doesn't it? It's like a sweet idea. My daddy is gone. But he's not really gone. He is better now than ever. And I will get to see him again. The Apostle Paul has a whole different view of, of death, unlike this gentleman. Um, Paul confronts his own death, and boy, it was going to be brutal. He was going to be beheaded. That was gonna, that's, he knew that's what was going to happen. I'm ready to have my head chopped off. Wow, now that's something to have to deal with. But Paul says these words as he anticipates his own death. The time of my departure is at hand, but I'm ready. I've run my race, finished my course. Uh, for me to live is, for me to die, live to, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain, I mean, this is the antithesis of the denial of Belshazzar. 
this is what you and I can expect to have. You know, I, I did some reading about Steve Jobs. Anybody ever heard of Steve Jobs? He makes all these fruity things, the apples. You know, Steve Jobs was not known to be a Christian, but an interviewer asked him one time, well, do you believe there's a God? And he says, I'm 50-50. Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. He said when he got his, he, he became sick with pancreatic cancer and he, the handwriting was on the wall. He expressed how that he hoped there was something. Actually, if you look at his, the devices he created, he avoided putting an on and off switch because he didn't like the idea of something that could be switched off because it reminded him of death. Isn't that interesting? Here's the question. Are you prepared to meet God? Are you going to come out of your parties long enough to ask the hard questions and deal with what really needs to be dealt with? And Secondly, the writing on the wall. Um, verse 22, but you, son, but you, his son, Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, although you knew all this. And you have lifted yourself up against the Lord of heaven. You have brought vessels out of his house before you, you and your lords and your wives and your concubines. You've drank wine from them. You have praised the God of, gods of silver and gold and bronze and iron, wood and stone, which do not see or hear or know. And the God who holds your breath in his hand and owns all your ways, you have not glorified when the fingers of the hand were sent from him and the writing was written, this is the inscription that was written, many, many teko ufarsin. This is the interpretation, many. God has numbered your, numbered your kingdom and it's finished. Actually, the, the opposing army was at the gates and they marched in that night. Uh, Tekel, you've been weighed in the balance. You've been found wanting. Perez, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. Then Belshazzar gave the command and clothed Daniel with purple and put a chain of gold around his neck and made a proclamation concerning him that he would be the third ruler in the kingdom. And that very night, Belshazzar, the king, Belshazzar, king uh, of the Chaldeans, was slain. And Darius the Mede received the kingdom, being about 62 years old. There are two things I see here. Number one is pride is a destroyer. It distorts our perceptions. He was throwing this party, what, because he wanted everybody to taste a lot of wine? No. He wanted to prove his own glory. You know, we're, we're not, we human beings are not good at re receiving and living in our own glory. Now, I'm not trying to say that you should succeed. And when you succeed, let me celebrate with you. I think that's so important. We will applaud you and celebrate with you. But have you ever been around somebody that did everything for their own glory? Hey, look at me. I'm the best. I'm the greatest. Yeah, there are people like that. Some may come to your mind right now. We're not good. There are story after story of people that became exceedingly wealthy, successful, and famous who were crushed under the weight of their own glory. Why? Because if you live for yourself and your own glory, you will be destroyed. I think the best illustration that reminds me of this is the sun and the moon. They illustrate this so perfectly. You know, the moon light is so amazing, it can light up a dark sky in the middle of the night. Don't you love a full moon? How it illuminates things all around you? Sort of like this gentle, soft light that allows you to navigate and see. I love a good moonlit night. When I was a, a little boy in 1969, I sat in front of a black and white television set and I watched the lunar landing 
and Neil Armstrong climbed down the ladder and set his foot on the moon. And I remember as I watched, is he going to die? He didn't die. He and Aldrin walked around the moon for three hours. Do you know that it would be impossible, and even astronauts aren't going to try this, to land on the sun? Because it is a fireball of intense energy and power. Well, how can the second brightest body in the sky, the moon, be something we could approach? You know why? There's no fire there. It just reflects the glory of the sun. If you and I succeed in life all for the glory of God, to complete the plan of God for our lives, it's going to be sweet if we succeed for our own glory. We, like Belshazzar, will be destroyed. Check your motives. Evaluate your perspective. Succeed for the glory of God. Um, there, uh, there is a, a, a man I, I've read, I uh, like his works. He was a philosophy professor in the University of Southern California. He, he's passed away. He was a devoted follower of Jesus. Um, his name was Dallas Willard, and he was a humble and unhurried man. His ideas and his books captivated people all over the world in many different professions. And the story is told about Dallas Willard, who one day in class had a student, a young student, challenge him with erroneous and combative statements. And after Dallas Willard listened to this student get on his high horse and challenge him, he answers him by saying, well, class, I think that's a good place to stop. After class was dismissed, another student came up and said, why did you do that? I've heard you before. You could have annihilated that guy with what you know and what you've said before. Why didn't you do that? And Dallas Willard answered and said, I was practicing the discipline of not needing the last word. Because we often look for the last word to prove our worth and to set ourselves up as preeminent. Wow. Have you ever been in a conversation, someone tells a story, and you think, oh, I'm going to tell a better story. I mean, come on, be honest. Have you ever done that? I have. So you tell your better story, and someone else tells the story. And you're like, well, that, that was okay, but man, I've even got a better story. Have you ever had that experience? We should all learn to practice the discipline of not needing the last word. People will tell you stuff that's ridiculous and untrue. And you don't have to always correct them or have the last word. I love Dallas Willard's humility. There's another guy that comes to my mind, and his name is Eric Liddell. Little, I don't know how to say it. He's, he was a Scot Scottish sprinter that went to the Olympics, and he was scheduled to run the 100-meter race, which he would certainly have won the gold um, because he was quick, and his speed had earned him many medals in, in, in his country. Uh, but it was scheduled for Sunday, and he had a personal conviction that he wouldn't run on the Sabbath. He considered Sunday his Sabbath. He was going to put God first and honor God, and so he refused to run on that race. And everybody was mad at him. His teammates were mad at him. His countrymen were mad at him. What are you, ki are you kidding us? You're going to forfeit a gold for Scotland because of your religious thoughts? He says, I, I just really can't run on Sunday. It's just a conviction I have. I always want to put God first. So you're going to forfeit a gold and honor God. Wow. Who does that anymore? He did. So he began to train for the 400, which he was not likely to win. His trainer, who was also a believer, slipped a piece of paper into his pocket as he went off to that race and said this, he who honors God will himself be honored. And he won the 400 
against all odds and set a new record. And Eric Little, who became famous for his running, said this, God made me fast. And when I run, I feel his pleasure. See how he lived his life to glorify God? That is the only path that is a safe and good path. Belshazzar, he took the path of pride. God says, it's over. We're not doing this anymore. What if you and I decided that we would give our lives to do great things for the glory of God. Did you, did you hear the way I worded that? Please don't do ordinary things or mediocre things or half-hearted things. Let's do great things for the glory of God. If you do great things for the glory of your, you, you're going to crush yourself and the people in your family and the people all around you. But if you do great things for the glory of God, you will be a source of blessing and refreshment for, you, for the people all around you. Your life will excel in meaning and purpose. But we've got to decide, who are we living for? I just want to mention a group of people in this church who I love so very much and admire more than I can tell you. Last year, we started a new program called High Street Institute, and we invited people to join the residency program, which they had to pay money. And it was an 11-month program where they had academic training on Monday and Thursday, and they had to work some other days. I mean, they became part of the staff. They were given tasks and assignments. I mean, we're, we're, we're talking really exciting things like they got to serve coffee, clean, clean up, up after an event. We had eight people who were so committed to giving their lives in service of God that they were willing to sacrifice, pay money, and endure all that went with an 11-month program. And they studied theology and New Testament and Old Testament and biblical counseling, and they, st they studied hermeneutics and how to prepare a lesson. And, and I have watched this group, and they've been amazing. Why? Because they are the antithesis of Belshazzar. They said, first, in our lives, we surrender our lives for the purpose God will have for us, whether that's in full-time ministry or in lay leadership in churches for the rest of our lives. This is what we're going to do. Wow. Um, I want to invite you all to their graduation, June 24, 7 o'clock, right here in this room. Come on, let's cheer these people on. And let's thank them for their service. And let's be schooled and inspired by their example. Um, in closing, I had to prepare a little video for my dad's memorial service because I'm not able to go to Manila. And how do you summarize like what your dad means in a five minute video? Nobody wants to hear a six-minute video. I'm just saying, okay, I've been to a lot of funerals. And so, um, so I got to be thinking, like, what am I going to say? What am I going to say? Finally, the thing that came to me was this. I appreciate most about my dad is that my dad, he didn't leave me in the angst of the meaningless and purposeless figure it out on your own. My dad told me and my mom the story of Jesus. How that I'm not alone. I'm not randomly walking around this world because stuff happened. But I was created by God with a plan and a purpose. And this God loved me so much that even though I have sinned, he sent his son Jesus to die on a cross to pay for my sin. And I loved the story. I thought it was great. I mean, I love God. I love Jesus. I mean, 
who do, what, what's, what's hard to love about God? Not, not very much. I mean, he's great. But I do remember the day when I was confronted with that existential thought of my own death. And I got scared. And I had a sense of dread. And I never had felt that before. But you know what? I didn't stay in that state for very long because my mom and dad had told me the story of Jesus. I just hadn't applied it yet. I went to my bedroom, knelt down beside my bed, and I prayed a prayer like this, Dear God in heaven, I know I'm a sinner, and I need to be forgiven. And Jesus, I believe you died to pay for my sin. Will you please forgive me, Jesus, and come into my life and save me? And like that, this peace of God flooded my heart. Something happened. And he's been with me every day since. Of all the things anyone could tell me about or share with me, that's the most important. And that's what my dad did. And I'm grateful. And that's what the life of Daniel is trying to point us to. A God who rules, a God who loves, and a God who will save those who come. Are you walking in pride today? And it's not going to work for you. Have you ever moved in pride in an argument with your wife or your children? How did that work out? We need to learn how to be humble, how to open up our lives to God and give our lives to Him. And may we be the best we can be for the glory of God and the blessing of the people around us. And our future is bright. Are you kidding me? Eternity in the kingdom of heaven. No sin, no tears, no sickness, no death. Whoa, that's not a story that depresses. That's a story that saves. Will you bow your heads? If you're here today and you've never accepted Jesus as your Savior, I'm not saying you haven't been in church. I'm just saying you've never come to that moment where you asked him to forgive you and save you. This is the most important message I could deliver to anybody today. So if that's your case, would you be willing to pray with me? Do you admit that you have sinned and that you fall short of the glory of God? Do, do you believe that God sent his son and Jesus died to pay for your sin because he wants to be with you for all of eternity? Will you receive the salvation that only Jesus can give? And if you're ready to do that, whether you're here or online, pray with me. God, I admit my sin. I acknowledge the distance between you and me. I need to be forgiven of my sin. And Jesus, I believe you're the only one who can do that. Because you went to the cross, you died, and then you rose again. And I want the hope of eternal life. And I want to be in a relationship with you, oh God, now and for all of eternity. So today, I ask you, to save me. Maybe you're here today and this hasn't been a very good week and you've moved in pride and your heart got hard and you pushed people away and maybe you just want to say to God, God, I'm going to ask you to forgive me and right now I want to just embrace humility as best as I can. Please help me. Help me to be who I'm supposed to be. bless the people around me with the spirit of humility and grace. I need you. So help me. I'm going to ask you to stand, if you will. I'm going to pray. And we're going to be down here in the front like we do often. You come. If, we, if you need someone to pray with you. I had someone come this morning. Need, they needed prayer because they're going to the hospital. Maybe you need to, to just have someone explain a little bit more about how to accept Christ. Come, we'll, we'll take the time. 
Maybe you just need someone to encourage you. That's what we're here to do. Dear God in heaven, thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you for your grace. I thank you that this story that you have put us in is a beautiful story when we know you. We can thrive in the chaos when you remain the Lord of all and the Lord of us. So I pray that you'd even bless the decisions that will be made in the next few minutes and um, save those who need to be saved. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen.